Hi, it's Matt Malkin here, and the question we have for today is just how far can you play the tape of the expanding universe backwards? We've already seen that the universe has been expanding for quite some time. Now that's basically what Hubble's law is telling us, and we go back quite far to a situation where the universe was considerably different than it is now. So we've already established, and this is really observationally proven beyond a reasonable doubt, that the universe has definitely evolved. The contents have certainly evolved. For example, galaxies in the past were brighter and forming more stars and full of gas and just different in a lot of ways from galaxies today. They were much more likely to have powerful quasars shining in them. They had uh, less heavy elements had been cooked up compared to today. So certainly the the contents of the universe have changed. If you go back even further, playing the tape backwards in this expanding universe, when the galaxies are even closer together, you get to a stage now, we're just getting to that point where maybe you can't find as many galaxies and as many quasars. Maybe we're seeing back now to the period before they existed. Okay, that's nice because that kind of galaxy, the evolution of the universe, satisfies or explains Olber's paradox that we looked at before. So there's not an infinite amount of light uh, to reach us here today to make the sky dazzlingly bright. So that's solved. However, it does not really answer the question yet. How far back could you really play the tape of this expanding universe? Maybe to a point before there were any galaxies. Well, what were the conditions then when the universe, for example, when the universe was maybe a thousand times smaller in each of its three dimensions. So everything was a thousand times closer together. Galaxies would be overlapping or touching. There weren't even galaxies in existence then. What was this? So a billion times higher density than the average density of the universe today. What were the conditions like? Was that a real thing? Was it really right to play this expansion backwards, you know, based on current trends today, or are we wrong? Maybe the universe did was in some different state back then, but that it uh, never really started at a very, very high density and high temperature state. That's the question, and of course, you cannot just accept this uh, on faith from uh, seeing an expanding Hubble law because we don't have the confidence to extrapolate it backwards. We need evidence. We need observational data that the universe really was, in fact, in a very hot, dense state early on when it was much denser, when the expansion had just gotten going. And you know, really, astronomers should have been thinking about this as soon as Hubble's law was discovered. But I think there was a bit of an emotional hang-up with that, because if you really believe that you can ex play the expanding universe tape backwards all the way, the conditions that you have to uh, entertain are so strange, so extreme, that a lot of people were thinking, darn, that sounds a lot like uh, creation. Uh, we really want to go there. Now, a lot of the same generation of scientists had just been through the whole big fight uh, about Darwin and uh, evolution of the species and so on. And they'd just gone through a long fight to, to establish, I think scientifically accurately, that the universe is extremely old. The uh, Earth is extremely old, four and a half billion years, and that the origin of the species took place over millions, actually billions of years, and did not look anything like one day when uh, all, everything was created uh, instantly. So having just been through a big, rather bruising fight on that, I don't think they really had the mood to deal with the direct implications of what the expanding universe and Hubble's law was actually saying. And so they didn't really deal with it much. It's funny, actually, the one uh, astrophysicist who did take this pretty seriously, that you really could play the expanding universe tape backwards a long way, maybe all the way, uh, was a guy named Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian who happened to be a Catholic priest and also a, a brilliant scholar and scientist. And he did actually consider what the conditions would be in a universe before it expanded very much to its current state. But still, 
no actual data. And as you've seen so many times in astronomy, the data that actually proved that the universe did begin in a very hot, dense state came by accident. But it's funny how the accidents always happen to astronomers. They're making a new observation with a new instrument, a new way of seeing the universe that is much more sensitive than pr any previous observations, even if it was not actually originally intended for astronomy. That's a fun thing. I've got the, uh, the unlikely uh, telescope that discovered basically the Big Bang here. Uh, it's still there in Holmdale, New Jersey, and it was on the grounds of Bell Laboratories, which was primarily interested in research that would have practical applications for communications. I believe this antenna here was largely built to help do uh, trans, uh, transoceanic, intercontinental uh, communications with radio wave signals. You could uh, bounce uh, telephone conversations, for example, off of satellites in orbit uh, over to Europe. And I think that the original uh, plans by these two brilliant uh, electrical engineers, Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias, there's Bob and there's Arno right there, standing in front of their very specialized radio antenna, was uh, to, to you know, pay the bills for Bell Labs and uh, try to make a, a transatlantic communications better. But then, since Bell Labs was a wonderful research institution as well, they had to give the scientists there a little bit of free reign. So the deal was that after the uh, practical task was done with the antenna, uh, Penzias and Wilson would get to just play around with their antenna a little bit, look and see if they could detect any signals from outer space for example, that might have some astronomical interests. That was, that, as far as I know, that was the plan. But here's the important point. This, this had the best Bell Labs receivers, the most sensitive detector of radio waves here at high frequencies that had not really been measured before. And you had two extremely fine engineers who really understood their instrument very well. And they understood that there was an additional subtle but very real source of noise, or I should say extra signal that was coming into their antenna that they could not account for. Now, most other uh, engineers would have just ignored this and said, well, oh, there's just some problem somewhere down in my amplifiers or something. I guess I'm not really too interested to try to track down what the cause of this apparent signal that apparently is coming from the sky is. But these guys, you can look at them. They look pretty serious, don't they, there? And they started making measurements. OK, is this interference? Is it coming from uh, big urban areas? But no. No, this signal didn't matter if the antenna was tilted over towards uh, New York City or over Philadelphia or whatever. It seemed to be coming from all directions in the sky uniformly. And they were obsessed by finding out what this radiation was. Was it being produced by something inside the antenna? Maybe it was just an artifact. Well, this is a dirty business. They had to clean out some of the pigeon nests in this antenna. And nope, that did not solve the problem either. The antenna was still picking up this microwave radiation. So it's uh, peaking at uh, a wavelength of less than a centimeter, maybe a few millimeters wavelength that this antenna was very good at measuring. And meanwhile, they really did not have an explanation. They were still working on that. Meanwhile, down the road at Princeton University, it's not that much of a drive from Homedale, a graduate student working in astronomy there at, as a radio astronomer, uh, Bernie Burke, listened to a colloquium by some very interesting uh, theorists who had thought a lot about the Big Bang and thought about George Lemaitre's bold theorizing that you could actually play the tape of the expanding universe backwards all the way to when the universe was much, much denser and then it would have much more heat in a small area, so it would be much hotter than today. And they had sort of rediscovered or accidentally rediscovered some calculations that even went back to another brilliant physicist named George Gamow, who had also speculated on the same thing. All of this stuff had been ignored, by the way. and really disregarded by people. But the, the Princeton physicists, Dickey, uh, Peebles, uh, Wilkinson, were uh, thinking 
Well, if the universe really was that hot and dense at that point, that sounds to us like anything that we've ever seen in this course before, an opaque object that's hot. It might be thousands of degrees hot that you can't see through because it's so dense. That sounds like a black body. Remember Kirchhoff's laws. So they reasoned correctly that, well, we don't know what this, uh, this early universe was like during the Big Bang, but it must have been full of radiation, and it must have described, uh, been described by a perfect black body spectrum, because that's what all opaque objects uh, produce by fundamental laws of matter and physics. And now what happened to all of that radiation? All of those high end, they were pretty bright photons because when the universe was thousands of degrees hot, my gosh, that's the temperature of the surface of the sun. So the universe would have been filled with blinding visible light, um, like if you were on the surface of the sun staring at it, for example. But over time, the universe expanded. We know that from Hubble's law. And what happens then? All of those photons, those background photons produced by the heat of the universe itself, redshifted. Actually, they, it's not, remember, the Doppler shift. It's simply that the wavelengths, as they're crossing intergalactic space, expand with the expansion of the space. So they guesstimated reasonably that by now the universe should be maybe a thousand or more times larger in each dimension and so the wavelength of these light waves started out as light waves would have expanded by a factor of a thousand they ought to now be at a wavelength of let's say about one millimeter instead of visible light which is a thousandth of a millimeter and they said where did it go there's nowhere for this radiation to go now it's microwave radiation it must still be here. So they had a theory. Maybe some people would consider this a little bit of a far out theory, but they had the courage of their convictions. They were starting to build a microwave uh, radio antenna on the roof of the Princeton physics building there, which might or might not have actually been able to detect this cosmic background radiation. I got to give them a huge amount of credit for having the courage to actually predict this reasonably correctly and then to try it. Bertie Burke heard the talk, drove back up to Bell Labs where he knew what Penzias and Wilson were doing. He said, you two groups should get together and meet because I think I'm, they may have discovered the explanation of this mysterious microwaves that you're getting in your home Dell antenna here, and it's big. It's bigger than you think it is. It's the Big Bang. Now, this must have been an absolutely historical meeting because uh, I think it was really hard for both of the groups to really understand exactly what the other one was trying to tell them. And so they decided to publish back-to-back -back papers, which are quite interesting to look at, because the first paper, of course, goes to the observers who actually detected this. And it has the most opaque, uh, uncommittal, neutral title. I think it's something like, on the detection of an apparent excess of radio emission at 2.8 millimeters. Uh, that's it. It's, it's, it's an excess noise. I think it's an excess noise. So it was on the detection of excess noise. Like you look at that and let's skip. I'm going to go to the next paper. Who, who even wants to read that paper? But the paper immediately following it by, was, by the Princeton theorist said a possible explanation for the source of the excess radio noise as detected at 2.8 millimeters by Penzias and Wilson. And that said this is the heat, the radiation left over from when the universe really was in a hot, dense state, the earlier stages of the Big Bang. That's a pretty remarkable conclusion, and it turned out to be the correct conclusion. So let's look a little more in detail about what had actually been discovered by accident. What, what is this? Now it's microwave radiation coming from all over the sky. Well, you have to go back to when the universe, there were no galaxies, no black holes, probably no stars even, no planets, just raw uh, matter in an atomic state. 
hydrogen, helium, very, very simple compared to how the universe is today, but at high temperatures with a lot of photons of relatively high energies. If you go back far enough, and you can see this in the sun also, to where the temperature of the universe was high enough, then what you're going to see, of course, we know this from uh, having looked at the physics of stars and so on, is that higher temperature corresponds to higher microscopic motions of individual particles. Uh, atoms will be colliding uh, with fairly high velocities at this high temperature with each other, and that is enough energy, that's enough heat, a high enough temperature to make all of the gas in the universe a, what do you have in the sun? A plasma, a fully ionized plasma. The collisions are too violent because the temperature would be above several thousand degrees. So neutral atoms, for example, which has a take a hydrogen, that's a proton with an electron in orbit around it, could not exist. They weren't stable earlier on in the history of the universe when the temperatures were too high. The photons and the energy of photons and the energy of collisions was too high for the universe to be anything except fully ionized plasma. So that part is correct. Now, that's fine. What was it that finally signaled the transition of the universe from a completely opaque state, like being inside the sun, you can't even see uh, an inch in front of you because the, the light is just bouncing around off of all of these ionized uh, atoms, particularly the electrons, and uh, it's, it's a complete fog. What was it that caused the universe to rather suddenly, in a fairly short amount of time, become completely transparent and suddenly open up so that photons which had been bouncing around literally like this at the speed of light, suddenly went straight, seemingly almost forever in the best they could do to travel in a straight line in a possibly curved universe. What That was an enormously important transition in the history of the universe. And we know a lot about it. And I'm sort of repeating some of the arguments that were made uh, by, for example, Peebles and Dickey, uh, and by the way, uh, was one of the reasons that Jim Peebles uh, very appropriately uh, was honored uh, with a recent Nobel Prize, uh, among many of his other huge contributions to astrophysics and cosmology. But what, what they correctly reasoned was that we have to go back to when the universe was passing, it's been expanding, the wavelengths of all the photons have been getting longer, when it cooled through the temperature of about 3,000 degrees, that's when all of a sudden it went from an opaque ionized plasma of gas to a neutral gas. All of the electrons were finally free to go and find a proton and hook up with them and make neutral atomic hydrogen and, in some cases, neutral atomic helium. And it happened, like I said, fairly quickly about 380,000 years after time zero. Okay, time zero, of course, is where we're extrapolating the currently expanding universe back to infinite density uh, and uh, infinite temperature. We'll see if that actually is a good extrapolation. But at least we now have direct observational evidence that it is OK to extrapolate the currently expanding universe a thousand times back to a billion times, three dimensions, a billion times higher density. And that is an enormous extension of human perception of, of the history of, of the cosmos there. This is the time uh, it's called of recombination because the electrons combined with their uh, protons, their ions. It really shouldn't be called recombination. That's what happens today when an ionized atom gets together and forms a neutral atom. But it, it was the first combination. Re implies it was like it had already happened before. But anyway, so I would call it the, the time of the great combination of all of the gas in the universe to be suddenly become transparent. So this diagram isn't really the greatest diagram. But uh, I doubt if I could do much better. Here are the yellow paths, jagged, random paths of photons trying to travel around. And they're just bouncing back and forth, particularly because they see all these free electrons, which they bounce off randomly. It's a complete uh, fog. 
and then all of a sudden the temperature drops down below about 3,000 degrees. All of a sudden neutral atoms can exist. Pretty much all of the free electrons go away. Even though the universe has been around for 380,000 years, I think this all happens in a few tens of thousands of years. And all of a sudden then the photons, whatever random direction they were going in, at the moment that the universe became transparent and neutral, they go off in straight lines at that direction. So if, you, if you're looking at a fog here, this red boundary here is like the wall, an opaque boundary beyond which we cannot see. That's where all of these photons finally went straight. And some of them actually are going straight for such a long time, they're traveling for thir more than 13 billion years, that they arrived in Homedale, New Jersey, and were picked up by the Penzias and Wilson uh, scoop, sugar scoop telescope, I think was the nickname of it. In fact, they're arriving today. In fact, they're arriving in this room now. If I had a really nice sensitive Bell Labs receiver, you can actually pick this radiation up. Now, if it really is cosmic, it's really coming from the entire universe at that time, there's a few predictions about this. First of all, there really should be no difference in what we observe in any particular direction because the universe was presumably uniformly the same in all directions. Actually, that's a bit of an assumption, but it is quite well confirmed. There's, there's reasons why that would be, which we'll get to. And second of all, it should be all about the same temperature as well. It should be very uniform. And what would the temperature be? Well, all of these photons, as we said, started out looking like a 3,000 degree black body, but now, after the universe has expanded by about a factor of 1,000, the exact factor is about 1,100, they have all shifted down now from visible light to microwave photons, and it but it should still correspond to a perfect black body, because a black body, which is greatly redshifted, is still a black body, just at a lower temperature. Now the temperature you want to do the math, you want to divide 3,000 degrees by 1,100, yes, you got it right. It's about 2.7 degrees, about 2.73 degrees. Now I'm talking about Kelvin degrees. That's degrees above absolute zero. And that, of course, is much harder to detect. And so uh, the Wien's Law says that the peak of something that a black body, which is only 2.73 degrees above absolute zero, is going to be out in the millimeter wavelengths. That's just Wien's law that we've already seen in this course. So that is the correct explanation of what it was that Penzias and Wilson had accidentally discovered. Now, if you're into keeping track of the prizes, I guess we're a little bit more sensitive to this now at UCLA. And so it seems like the way these things always go, the observers who actually detected the microwave background without even knowing what they were doing, honestly, great engineers, but with no plan to be looking for this, just a pure accident of serendipity with their telescope, they get the prize for the discovery of the radiation from the Big Bang explosion. The Princeton theorists who predicted this, who calculated correctly and actually started to try to build equipment that might have had a chance of detecting it, they get, well, everybody thinks they're very smart. So they, they get a lot of goodwill. But they know trip to Stockholm. Well, people's had to wait for many decades for that. So at least a little justice was done. But that is the way these things go. And so as soon as we had that clue, then we've actually got light, it's microwaves now, coming from a much earlier stage universe. We see it's completely different from today. There are no galaxies, there are no stars at all, and we're going to study this the heck out of this, right? Because this is our one clue about how the universe really was when it was only several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. If you want to go back and get clues be, be, before that time, and people are always asking about that, you want to go back close to the Big Bang, you're not going to be able to do it with photons because we can't see past there. It's really a solid opaque wall. We'll have to use indirect evidence. But anyway, this is the first piece of evidence. I have two I want to tell you about today. And so I have now an answer, my first answer, to the question of the day here. Was there really a Big Bang 
Show me the data. What is the actual evidence? And I've shown you now evidence piece number one. This is the proof, for example, that the universe has not just always been in a fairly similar state to today. It's been expanding. There was one very popular theory, which I would say a lot of the smart money was on in the 60s before this discovery uh, rocked the world by accident in, in, in 67. The smart money was really on the steady state theory, for example, that said, no, uh, the universe is going to keep expanding. It's always, forever, forever been like it is now. The expansion solves Oprah's paradox, but why? how can there be an expansion and stay in steady state? The one little tricky thing about the steady state theory that they didn't like to brag about is it required matter to be continuously created out of nothing so-called continuous creation. So instead of having a moment of creation in something like a Big Bang, it sounds practically like Genesis, they had continual, very small little bits of matter being created out of a vacuum, which, sorry, does not actually happen today. So that theory turned out to be wrong. But it was, at the time, it was, and it was also getting to be in trouble because it really couldn't explain how come there's so many quasars uh, at a large distance to us back in time compared to very few of them today. So the steady state theory was already losing followers anyway, even though it was mathematically very elegant and the smartest, most articulate people were all advocates for it. But man, when the Big Bang came along, it was game over. There's just no explanation for that in the steady state theory. The Big Bang was real for the first time. All right, so now with that success under our belts, you want to go back even further than just when 380,000 years after the expansion started? Do you have the guts to do that? Do you have the nerve? Sure you do. All right, so that's what we're going to try to do next. But this is going to be an indirect argument. We're going to have to play the tape of the universe way back, much further than we have so far, to see if we can find traces, uh, fragments, uh, fossils, basically, left over from the first three minutes of the Big Bang. Yes, even that stuff is still around today if you know where to look and exactly what you're looking for. All right, so first of all, just to, to wrap up here, the photons are still here. There's nowhere for them to go. They're in the universe. What do they do? Leave the universe? No. The only thing that's happened is they've expanded their wavelengths. They're vastly redshifted compared to when they started. And that is detected when you look in the millimeter wavelengths or with a good antenna. You don't even have to buy it from Bell Labs these days. Lots of antennas can detect this. In fact, can measure it with great accuracy. And they can also measure the spectrum very accurately. This is the mo one of the most beautiful spectral measurements ever made. And sure enough, another check that I already mentioned to you, exactly the black body shape. This is the spectrum as a function of frequency here, and this is the exact mathematical shape of a Planck function, uh, a, black, a perfect black body curve at exactly 2.725 degrees above absolute zero. So it really was perfectly opaque and uniform, almost entirely perfectly uniform in all directions. Further confirmation that we are actually looking at the radiation from the early stages of the Big Bang. But going further here, we're going to have to consider really extremely high temperatures, very high energy photons, and very high speed motions among particles in this plasma. In fact, we're going to be getting back to when it was millions of degrees in temperature. What kind of things happen, for example, when protons or fundamental nuclear particles collide at those kind of high temperatures and energies? It's looking like a, ra a version of the center of the sun, except now I'm not just talking about in one place. I'm talking about throughout the entire universe. The possibility, which we now will consider, that thermonuclear fusion reactions were able to take place, if you play the tape far enough back, throughout the entire observed universe and maybe a whole lot more universe that we haven't observed yet. 
So how far back do you have to play the tape to do this? Well, first of all, you have to, it's not just good enough to be 3,000 degrees. It has to have been much hotter than that. So the universe must have been another factor of 10,000 times smaller than even when it produced, uh, when it came transparent and let the cosmic background radiation fly freely out. We have to go back to temperatures of tens of millions of degrees, and those have only been seen in the first about 200 seconds, the first three minutes since time t equals zero, t equals zero being the nominal time when all distances were zero, when the Hubble expansion and Hubble's law actually started. If you think we have the guts and the nerve or the foolhardiness to play the tape of the expanding universe that far back, then we're going to make some predictions about what these fundamental nuclear fusion reactions could have done and what they could not have done. Let's see. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump a bit here and play the expanding universe of the tape backwards. I really want to start at about one second. So where we're going with this, and I'm going to take this up uh, in part two here, is I want to give you the second piece of evidence that really is another smoking gun, literally, uh, of the correctness of the Big Bang theory going all the way back to before the first minute since the Big Bang started. These two pieces of evidence here, the accidental discovery and verification of the cosmic microwave background, and then the abundances of primordial atomic nuclei that were produced, that were synthesized throughout the entire universe during the first three minutes of the Big Bang. Those are our two most crucial pieces of evidence that tells us that the Big Bang really did happen. It's not just a theory now. It is actually what happened uh, in good quantitative detail, at least back to the first second. I have to say, we really understand this is quite amazing for humans to have figured this out. We certainly have a very accurate history of what the universe has done on a large general scale, at least going back to uh, when it was only one second old. And later on in the course, we'll see we actually apparently have a very good idea even much before that. But step by step at a time. I thought it was already a big leap to go back to when the universe was 400,000 years old. Now we're going back even much further. All right, so we'll pick up uh, soon uh, in the next lecture at a universe that is one second old.